Good morning from Colorado, although as I am recording this, it is the afternoon. Thank you all for having me today and allowing me to be part of your conference. Um, a gracious thank you to the organizers of the conference for hosting one that's virtual. These have been a delight to attend over the past year and have been really convenient as we are all scattered about um, doing our work and our research. The name of my presentation today is an exploration of Gavin Langmuir's theories of rationality. My name is Madison Tarleton. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Denver and ILIF School of Theology, joint doctoral program in the study of religion. Historians, particularly, particularly historians of medieval history, are often challenged by ideas about what it means for something to be religious, be a religion, or even what religions are. Scholar Christine Ames, playing on Jay-Z Smith's famous article, Religion, Religions, Religious, charts a shift, a distinctive shift in medieval history from what she calls a church history to a history of religious culture. Ames goes on to argue that medieval historians have not spent nearly enough time studying the coexistence and intermingling of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, particularly as they relate, intersect, and influence what we consider the European Middle Ages. The reason I chose to invoke the voice of Christine Ames in the opening slides of a presentation clearly titled um, after an author is because she calls on the work of Gavin Langmuir as an exemplar for this shift in medieval history. She considers his work to be a great example of a scholar and a historian who used religion as well as the fields of psychology and sociology to unpack what it meant to be a historian, a religious scholar, a sociologist, a psychologist, an anthropologist, and more. Ames uses Langmuir to demonstrate his applicability in history as well as in religion. She also refers to his legacy when thinking about the treatment of Jews, anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, and religion, which is where I will begin today. In 1990, scholar and author Gavin Langmuir produced two single author monographs. The first, History, Religion, and Anti-Semitism, and the second, Toward a Definition of Anti-Semitism. In both of these books, he postulates about a bifurcation of the terms anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism, specifically in the context of medieval history. This bifurcation is also compounded by additional terminology that he uses to regard things like doubt and rationality. Used together, these books clarify his specific definitions of what he calls a non-rational anti-Judaism and an irrational anti-Semitism. Langmuir offers three types of thinking directly relevant to religious thought and action. These are rational, empirical, non-rational, and irrational. These are the types of thinking that drove Christian thoughts, acts, and any ideas about Jews. My overall interest and sort of the longevity of this project, both as a dissertation and sort of a lifelong research endeavor, is in the applicability of using these, not, these ideas of a non-rational anti-Judaism and an irrational anti-Semitism to better understand the representations of Jews in the medieval Spanish context using material culture. Now, I know that sounds like a mouthful, but that is, again, the crux of a very large project. For this presentation, I'm going to focus specifically on unpacking Langmuir's specific ideas about rationality, scholarship that came before and after, and then unpacking a little bit about other scholars and how they define things like rationality and reason in a much broader context. So we have three slides that are kind of gonna mirror each other. The first is, is just the definitions um, that come from his works. So first we have rational empirical thinking. This is thinking that is constrained by logic and observation. 
He calls it a common human property that enables us to solve practical problems that we must solve for our survival. So these are just your observation skills, the things that you can critically look at and understand at the onset what they are. You see a tree, you understand it as a tree. You see a lamppost, you understand it as a lamppost. But these are things that we must know in order to survive and to solve problems about things around us. Non-rational thinking, he calls symbolic thinking. This is the type of thinking that finds expression in art and affirmations of belief. Belief is really important here as this will sort of snowball into understanding things about religion. This mode of thinking is the resultant of the totality of our experiences, a resultant that we express in the dominant beliefs that guide our conduct. So non-rational thinking is really important for Langmuir when we try and understand things like religion, religious belief, and religious conduct. Finally, irrational thinking. Thinking becomes irrational when the interplay between what is non-rational and what is rational is inhibited when people repress their capacity for observation and reality testing in an effort to protect cherished non-rational beliefs that are menaced by rational empirical knowledge. So these all kind of seem like a mouthful, but as we move through, we'll show specific examples um, of what kind of these play out to be. So some examples, and we're gonna use the Christian Eucharist um, as an example of a ritual in Christianity to sort of understand where he's coming from. I'm following the lead of Christine Ames because she offers a really succinct linear example and a pattern. This is actually her example that she outlines in her article. So rational empirical thinking, this is our thinking of observation. She would say, I see a wafer. I can see the Eucharistic wafer. I can perceive that it is a wafer using my observation skills that are necessary for my survival. Non-rational thinking is when religiously compelled ideas conflict with your rational ones. I know Christ is present in that wafer. This is again tied into things like belief and symbolic thinking. Your rational empirical thinking tells you it's a wafer, but your non-rational thinking that guides your dominant beliefs and the way that you conduct yourself in a religious setting tells you that Christ is present in that wafer. We won't get into specifics about transubstantiation or not, but we understand that from this mode of thinking, Christ is somewhere in this wafer, either symbolically or literally. Now our rational thinking is when you cannot appropriately solve the conflict between the rational and the non-rational. And irrational, irrationality can then result. So this is where he would say that we have host desecration myths. And this is the idea that um, Jewish communities would steal, hoard, find, take Eucharistic wafers and stab them so they would bleed in a sort of a symbolic way like Christ bled when he was crucified. So the way we got here, this may seem a little left field, but the way that we got here is while Christian communities in uh, medieval Europe are trying to understand their belief system and trying to reconcile these two types of thinking, doubt begins to creep in about their own religious experiences. The way that they dealt with doubt was scapegoating, otherizing, um, and enacting violence against minority communities who they felt threatened their own religious beliefs. So the irrational thinking here occurs when these communities feel threatened by the Jewish community's inability to perceive the same systems of belief. Finally, we'll do a side-by-side -side of the specific definitions and the examples themselves to kind of wrap this up. So rational empirical thinking tells us that I see a wafer and it is just a wafer. By Langmuir's definition, this is because rational empirical thinking is constrained by logic and observation. It enables us to solve, to solve practical problems like the identification of an item. Non-rational thinking tells us that Christ is in or present in that wafer. By Langmuir's definitions, this is symbolic thinking that finds expression in art and affirmations of belief.
Finally, irrational thinking allows us to move from this is a wafer to this wafer has Christ present to Christ is present in this wafer and the Jews are trying to kill him using methods of host desecration. Langmuir argues this is wrapped up in doubt about personal beliefs and the intersection of rational and non-rational thoughts. By definition, he says that thinking becomes irrational when the interplay between non-rational and rational thinking is suppressed to protect the non-rational beliefs, the symbolic beliefs that have roots in religion. Now, how did we get here? What led Gavin Langmuir to these specific definitional distinctions that I would argue changed the field of medieval history, anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism? They're heavy, they're messy, and they have a lot of definitional variant. There are several influential authors that have come before and after Langmuir who've ushered in the study and debate of medieval anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. Three early authors, Joshua Trachtenberg, Jules Isaac, and Bernhard Blumenkranz, authored these very specific books that both dealt with things like Christian anti-Semitism and the roots of anti-Semitism, specifically in a medieval context. Then we have authors like Ruth Malenkoff and Hannah Arendt. Finally, the field of medieval history, religion, anti-Judaism, and anti-Semitism, and the intersection of Christian and Jewish um, religious ideologies began to allow this field to blossom. While there are several books that were influential before and after Gavin Langmuir, his ideas of rationality have not come without critique, criticism, or disagreement. As you may expect, an, an author from the 1990s postulating about ideas of rationality from medieval Europe or from the Middle Ages is definitely going to be up for scrutiny. Four important authors um, that I would like to highlight, Urban Resnick, Robert Stacey, Robert Shazan, and Anna Sapir Abulafia have all critiqued Lamier's theories for their lack of grounding in other disciplines besides religion, besides history, and what they might call a convoluted version of psychology and sociology. Ultimately, these scholars disagree with Langmuir's invocation of things like rational, irrational, and non-rational, because it presupposes that ideas of rationality were upheld in the medieval world in the same way that we think about them today. So what do we do with ideas of rationality in the medieval world? I will close with a few comments about scholarship, philosophy, theology, and reason and rationality in a medieval context. Philosophy is a main contributing field that helps to outline definitions of reason and rationality, specifically in a medieval context, although this moves beyond what we have thought about as perhaps traditional philosophy. Medieval theories of moral reasoning, a resource I found from the Stanford Encyclopedia, was very helpful in exploring, exploring authorship, both primary and secondary, for how to continue to define and narrow down ideas of reason and rationality. Having substantial grounding in the moral theologies of St. Augustine and the ethics of Aristotle, medieval authors and commentators like Thomas Aquinas and Albert the Great dealt and wrestled with concepts of reason and morality in order to pave the way for future philosophers like Kant. None of these philosophers, none of these authors come without their own share of criticisms and critique, especially in the modern world. However, what this project aims to do is think about the ways that definitions of reason and rationality have changed over time to better unpack Gavin Langmuir's own ideas about non-rational and irrational ways of thinking. Ultimately, the way that he explores reason and rationality are enlightening and can enlighten the way that we think about Christian responses, reactions, and violence towards Jews in the medieval community. And they can help us think about the ways that Christian communities represented Jews 
in material culture, in artifacts, and how we can then understand specific communities in Europe um, better using these types of things. I decided to end with um, a little bit of a literature review on medieval anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism, and the other. Um, this will obviously be available, but I did want everyone to see kind of where I was working from. We start with Joshua Trachtenberg from 1943 and his book entitled The Devil and the Jews, The Medieval Conception of the Jew and Its Relation to Modern Anti-Semitism. Then we move to Jules Isaac's book, um, which has been translated into English, Has Anti-Semitism Roots in Christianity? As we move, we see that some of the books get a little bit more specific. And finally, we get all the way up to 2019. Um, with Monsters and Monstrosity in Jewish History um, and Hannah Johnson's Stories People Tell About Blood Libels. <laughs>